All right, when you first open up Adobe Animate, this is the screen that greets you. We can see our recently opened files where we can create an open file here on the left. And over here at the top, we have start a new file fast, which is useful for creating some of the more common animation formats. So we're gonna select full HD here, and this will start a new project. And the only thing we're gonna change to this settings is change the frame rate from 30 frames per second to 24 frames per second. We're changing it to 24 because that is pretty much the standard for frame by frame animation. Depending on what country you're in and what your clients need, you might need to export at 25 or 30 frames per second, but we're gonna stick with 24 throughout this course. So I'm gonna give a quick walkthrough of where everything lives in the interface here. So in the middle, we have our animation stage, which is the equivalent to our composition window in After Effects. And let's zoom out a bit. And I'm gonna zoom out by pressing Control and then minus. So then we can see our full stage here. We can adjust the size up here as well. On the left, we have all of our tools here. On the bottom, we have our timeline, very similar to After Effects. You can see this one is a lot more focused on frames. We have more of these markers all the way through, which come in very handy. And then on the right, we have the properties panel, which will change depending on what tool is selected. Now, I would highly recommend you upgrade to Animate 2020 if you're not already updated. They have overhauled the interface enormously, so this looks far more in line with the rest of the Adobe suite. And for me, that made a huge difference and just made it a lot more intuitive. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go through some of the drawing tools on the left here. So the one I've selected is the classic brush. And when I draw on the stage here, it creates a line like you'd expect. We have a few options over here. We've got the smoothing and our size here. The brush size is at four at the moment. We can increase that by moving the slider down here, but we can also increase and decrease the size by pressing the left and right square bracket on our keyboard. So the left square bracket will decrease the size by one and the right square bracket increase it by one. I'm gonna push this all the way down to about four, which I think is what I'll be animating most of this course in. Now in Animate 2020, we also have another brush over here, which is called the Flow Brush. Now here you can see a lot more properties here. And when we draw, we've got taper selected. So we get this nice tapering to our line here. So here we can adjust how stable it is, the curve smoothing, the angle, loads more things to adjust here. I kind of find these more distracting than I need them for. So I'm gonna stick with the classic brush, just so we can focus more on the animation and not really on the line quality. If you wanna get a specific look with your lines, definitely go for the flow brush, especially if you're cleaning up and you want it to look a little more artistic. That's also an option for you as well. Then we've got the pencil tool down here. And when we draw with this, we can see it's drawing with red, which is our stroke color, where we can see our fill in strokes down here. So this is drawing a stroke and not a fill, whereas the brush tools are kind of creating a filled in shape. So if we press V on our keyboard, which selects the arrow, which you can also select up here on the left. Let's zoom in a bit, actually. Let's hover over our line and we can see this arcing shape underneath our cursor. And if we click and move it, we can see that it edits that line really smoothly as if we're editing its bezier points here. Now we can do that on a lot of lines here in Animate. So if we do it on this line here, we can see it doesn't move the shape of the line, it moves the perimeter because this is a drawn filled in shape rather than a single line that the pencil tool creates. So both useful for different purposes. And then down below, we've got our tool options where we can draw a rectangle or an ellipse, exactly how you'd expect. We've got a type tool, a line tool, and a polygon tool as well. Probably won't be using any of those throughout the course, but useful to know that they're there. And down here, we've got the eraser. We'll be using the eraser a lot in this course. And that does exactly what you'd expect. It erases anything underneath it on the selected layer. I tend to like to draw with one finger on the B and one finger on my E key, which is the shortcut for brush and eraser. So I can select a brush. And then if it goes awry, I can press E and correct any mistakes I make. And we're gonna be making a lot of mistakes and drawing really roughly. So this comes in very handy. Let's make a closed shape here so I can explain the fill bucket here. So the paint bucket tool, I should say, which shortcut is K, you can just fill in any shape like that just by clicking on it, exactly how you'd expect. And the eyedropper tool works exactly like it does in any other software. And down here, we've got a camera tool, a hand tool, and a zoom tool. And we won't be using the camera in much in this course. The hand tool, the shortcut for that is the space bar, where you can just grab and move the cameras around. And you can use the magnifying glass zoom tool to sort of zoom in closer on specific things if you need to. I tend to use the control minus and control plus to navigate with zoom, but you can also use this tool as well. We also have a few more tools up here on the top left. So let's select the lasso tool. We can do that with a shortcut L on our keyboard, which selects this one over here. And from here, we can select any area of drawings that we want, and then simply click and we can move those around. Now, if we press Q on our keyboard, it will bring up these transform tools. And from here, we can rotate and move these things around and adjust their scale. And if you can hold control and click on the corners, you get like a free transform here. 
handy if you need to draw something in perspective. And if you hover over selection and you get this two-way line with an arrow, you can skew your transformation here. And in the middle, this white dot is an anchor point, so we can move that wherever we need to. And then when we rotate it, it will rotate on that axis and scale up from that point as well, like an anchor point would in After Effects. Okay, let's fit this to window over here. So now I can see it fully. And let's get rid of all of this mess by selecting this keyframe down here, which selects everything on that frame. And then I'm gonna press delete to get rid of it. Now I'm gonna explain how the timeline works. Let's select our classic brush here. And we're gonna notice down here on layer one, this first frame is a blank keyframe. And we can see that because this circle is not filled in down here. But once we start drawing something, let's draw a bit of a circle. It becomes light gray and this circle gets filled in black, which means that is now a keyframe. Now there's three main shortcuts which are gonna be really useful when creating frames and navigating the timeline down here. Now the first one is F5 on your keyboard. And when we press F5, it adds another frame. We can keep pressing F5 to add more frames to this drawing. We can even select a bunch of frames, press F5, and it will increase the duration of that frame by that amount. Now if we hold Shift and click F5, it will reduce the amount of frames. And we can do the same as well, select a large bunch, press Shift F5, and it will remove that amount of frames from that drawing. Let's add a few more frames here. And then I'm gonna select a frame here in the middle and press F6. And what that does is creates a new keyframe. And this is gonna create a keyframe of the same shape that we have here. So at the moment, our first frame here and our second frame here are identical. So there's no difference in animation. But if we select the circle in the second frame and move it over to the right, we can now see a difference in their position. And to play back on the timeline and animate, you need to press enter rather than spacebar that you do in After Effects. And also a very useful thing to do is go up to control here and select loop playback and that will loop whatever we have in our timeline so f6 creates a new keyframe and if we hold shift in f6 that deletes that keyframe so now we're back to just one frame of this first circle let's go back and add that other circle again and then let's nudge that a bit further to the right and then the third keyboard shortcut where we're really going to use in the timeline is f7 so when we click that we've created a new blank keyframe so now nothing is visible on our stage so let's select our brush tool and let's draw a sort of flattened oval over here on the right, as if that ball is sort of flattened over here on the right. So now we've got three frames of this animation. Let's play that back to see how that looks. All right, we've got a little bit of animation, but it looks not great. So what are some things we can do to improve it? Well, we can see these two frames are pretty close together and these two on the right are pretty far apart. Both drawings are pretty different. So we need to draw a frame in between these two, which communicates that they're the same object, a little clearer and not this circle distance appearing and this blob jumping up here. So to do that, I'm gonna add another frame with F5. So we've got four frames of this one here. And then I'm gonna press F7 on my keyboard to create a blank keyframe. So then I can draw that in-between frame. And drawings that go between two poses are known as in-betweens or in-between frames. But at the moment, I can't see what to draw because I can't see the frame before or the frame after. So to do that, we're gonna use that onion skins, which is this button down here. So when we click that, we can see this selection area come up on our timeline. And on the right, we've got a green line, on, on the left, a blue line. So on the right, that is indicating that all the frames visible within this area to the right of the playhead are gonna be tinged slightly green, and all the ones to the left are gonna be tinged blue. And we can extend this area here so we can see more of the frames ahead. We don't have any more frames ahead, so we won't see any more here. But if we extend this one on the left for the back, we can see our first frame as well because it exists within this selection. And onion skins are essential in frame by frame animation. This helps keep you on track and really helps you know where to draw anything at all. So now I'm gonna draw a shape that fits in between these two shapes. So it's gonna be kind of rounded and kind of flat. Let's put that there. And now we can select it, nudge it to the left as well. So now we've got an in-between frame between these two poses. And if we play that back, that looks a lot smoother. Still not something I'd put on my show reel but it's looking a lot better than it was before. Now, if you right click down here, you can go to advanced settings and that'll bring up your onion skin settings here. And here you can change how opaque you want each of the onion skins to be. And you can even change what colors you want. I know some people prefer to have gray or red or other colors. I'm gonna stick with the defaults for now, but if you are animating something that was both green and blue, these might not be the best color choices and you might want to adjust them here, but let's leave those for now. Another option that we have here next to onion skins is edit multiple frames. So if we select this, we get the same sort of selection zone on our timeline, but without the blue and the white dots. And what this is doing is showing all the frames in that selection visible on our stage at once. And if we push this further to the left, we can see our first frame in there as well. So we can see every frame that we've drawn in this animation in the one view. Now this can be really handy to sort of get a glimpse at how the motion is looking. And from here, we can edit them all at once. So say if we think, well, maybe these should be closer together, we can select our last frame here, this most squashed ball, 
and nudge that to the left. And this circle one here, we can nudge that to the right to make that closer together. And this first circle one, we might want to say, well, all these frames are getting smaller as the as time goes on. Maybe we want this first frame to be even bigger. So we can press Q on our keyboard, bring up our transform controls, and maybe make this circle a little bigger and nudge that to the left too. And now we can see maybe this animation is going to look a bit smoother and a bit more coherent. There we are, that's looking a little better. And this can be a really useful way to edit your frames. And let's just turn that off here by selecting it here. Now, another really useful way to navigate the timeline is by using the keyboard shortcuts, the less than symbol and the greater than symbol, which are also the comma and the full stop. Uh, they're the keys in between the M and the question mark on your keyboard. And therefore just navigating the timeline one frame to the right or one frame to the left. And we'll be using that a lot. Now, one thing it's very important to cover here as well is what is the difference between animating on ones and animating on twos? You may have heard this term before, you may understand it. Here's what it means. I've got six layers down here. At the bottom three, I've turned the visibility off. So let's just focus on the top three here. We have our text layer, which extends all the way across our timeline here with just the one frame. And then below we have our twos and our ones. And you'll notice the ones. We have a new frame every single frame in the animation. Whereas on the twos, we've got two frames for every drawing. So there's twice as many drawings on the ones as there is on the twos. Let's play that back and see how they both look differently. They're both doing the same animation, moving from the left to the right at the same speed. So the main difference here is we'd say the animation at the top is looking a little bit maybe choppier or steppier because it's playing back essentially at a lower frame rate because it's got half as many drawings. And we call that animating on twos because we're drawing a frame every two frames. Now you might think, why would we ever draw on twos when we can draw on ones and it looks a lot smoother? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that it's a lot more work to animate on ones. I wouldn't say it's twice as much work because all the general rough animation and planning is the same for both methods, but the cleanup will take twice as long because you've got to draw twice as many frames. And also there can be a lot of appeal in animating on twos as well, which we're going to get into in the second example here. This example is probably going to make the twos as unflattering as possible because it's viewed right next to an animation on ones. And if you viewed it in isolation, it'd be a lot harder to see the frame rate. So both of these animations were done linearly. So if we select uh, edit multiple frames and let's drag this throughout our whole timeline, you can see that these are all evenly spaced. Every drawing is the same distance away from the previous drawing. Now let's look at our bottom example. So these bottom examples were animating with an ease in and an ease out. Similar to if you easy ease these keyframes in After Effects. So how are we getting these to start slower, speed up in the middle, and then end slower at the end? How are we achieving that by drawing the frames? Let's hide the top three layers, and then let's go to select uh, edit all keyframes here. And we can see that we've just got a lot more drawings at the start where it's slower, Fewer drawings in the middle, more spaced apart, and then at the end, a lot more drawings closer and closer together. And they get closer and closer together until the animation stops. So that's how we control speed in frame by frame animation. More frames equals a slower animation, fewer frames, faster animation. Now here, when we compare the one on twos and the one on ones, here I find the one on twos a lot more appealing. The one on ones seems a little too smooth and digital, especially at the end of the really slow parts here. That might be exaggerated by the fact that it's the exact same drawing on each of these frames. But to me, I think the one on twos has a little more charm. Some animators describe animating on twos as having more sparkle. And I'm not trying to go that far, but it certainly has a really appealing look. And I think that might be achieved just because we associate it so much with hand drawn and animation. When I'm drawing things frame by frame, I really want it to look like it was drawn frame by frame. I'm not trying to mimic what a computer might animate because we may as well use a computer for that. So that's the main reason why I choose to animate on twos. And for all of this course, all of the frame by frame animation will be animated on twos. So you might say, if we're animating every other frame on 24 frames per second, why don't we just animate the whole thing on 12 frames per second? And you certainly can do that. I've done that before in the past and I haven't had issues with that. But if we animate on 24 frames per second, it makes exporting a little easier to get into a desired frame rate. And it means that if we wanted to animate a section of the animation on ones, we can do that. So let's turn off our edit multiple frames here and turn on our onion skins. And in this middle section where we're moving really fast, we might want to add a few more frames in our twos animation here to communicate a bit more information here where it's traveling a lot faster. So to create a new frame, I'm going to select this frame down here and press F6, which will duplicate this frame. And then I'm just going to nudge that over with my arrow keys on my keyboard till it's aligned in between those frames. And then on this frame after, I'm gonna do the same process, press F6, and then nudge this one over. So now we have in the middle of our animation on twos, this fast section, which is on ones. And here's how that looks. 
Now, it's really not that perceptible here. You're not gonna notice much of a difference between animating on twos and animating on ones. This middle section will be a little bit smoother and we can communicate more information. People typically break from animating on twos and animate on ones where there's really fast motion and it's important that we see clearly what the animation is. Say if you've got a character that's flapping their arms about, if you animate that on twos, it might just look like their hands are going from up to down, up to down. But on ones, you might be able to see a lot more detail of their arms bending and moving in interesting ways and communicate the idea a lot clearer. And that's what animation is all about. You're communicating an idea or an emotion as effectively as possible. Sometimes ones will do that more efficiently, sometimes twos will do that more efficiently. And also a thing to note, when we're animating on twos, I might refer to adding another frame in between these two frames. And most of the time what I mean is I'm adding a new drawing that takes up two frames between there. If I'm extending something by some frames, I'll maybe say extending a frame here or there. So there can be some confusion between what someone means when they say add a frame or add a drawing. You'll probably be able to tell with the context, but I'll shout it out if I think there will be any confusion over what I mean. So let's go over to our first project that we opened and let's get rid of all of these frames here by pressing Shift F6. And we are gonna import our style frame ready to animate. That's really easy to do. We just need to get a file and drag it into our stage. And there it's added on this layer. And from here, we're really gonna be using this as a guide. So we don't need it to be this visible. So I'm gonna double click on this little icon down here and change the opacity down to 20. And then I'm just gonna lock this as well. So there's no chance of us moving it. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is animate the snow. 